here. So yeah, if I missed the question too, Bill. It's just who you are and yeah. why you're here kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, I'm Darren Henshaw, I live in Johnson's Flats on Kettle. And so this spring, I had quite a bit of property shaved off my place and I lost a good section of my burn. And so in the future, I foresee problems, not only on my own property, but likely uh, the river, if nothing's done, will affect my neighbor downstream in a significant way like I did this spring. And we're her neighbors downstream. Sorry, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Yeah, we were all talking about um, air props and lower and the river and everything. And we're trying to protect our houses. But um, what's interesting part of it, I don't know if they actually got the permit for that, but the people across the river from my house, they made a trench and made themselves a beautiful beach right on the river. That's not allowed. <laughs> It's not my question to get a permit for that. No. no. Because that that hole they made, it's actually gonna flood the rest of the people behind them. Where I mean them. unless it's well associated like a pipe or like a license associated. I guess. <laughs> Can't imagine. <laughs> but maybe I'll uh, is, is is there anybody else? Okay. And not that I want to rush or anything, but my it's my four year old's birthday and they're playing in the spray park. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the only reason. Otherwise, I'm so. Um, I'll make my name available too for anybody who wants to uh, talk to me more. But um, yeah, I just. Um, where's my. So, just a quick presentation I'll run through. And it's kind of on, like, you know, what we're talking about. What is a riparian area? The other considerations of our riparian areas and why there's so much concern around them and why there's a permitting process in place. And um, to hopefully give you some knowledge about how these areas work. And I feel like if you know more, you feel more comfortable with it. Like we, we live by the river, we're in a river community, we don't want to be scared of it. And uh, that's really important and I feel more knowledge you have, um, maybe the more comfortable it will be. But, um, so this looks like a spacey photo, but it's actually, I should, I wasn't gonna say, my brother's an Air Canada pilot, so he always takes photos for, he probably shouldn't, but <laughs> takes photos from above for me. And you can't really see it because it's dark, but this is the Granby River down, coming through here, it's kind of dark, but. And there's the uh, Christina Lakes in there. Um, let's see, oh, okay, Granby River. Okay, Christina Lakes over there, and then you can see Grand Forks in there. And um, I guess, you know, all of our problems where we're here is because it's right in front of us, but we really have to look at the big picture as well and understand, you know, it's, a, it's cumulative impacts and what we do affects everyone else and stuff, especially on river systems, right? Um, so I've been uh, working on, so for the last few years I'm, I'm a biologist and I work with a nonprofit here and a bunch of some of my colleagues, Barb Stewart and Brenda Lacroix, like we just realized how important riparian areas are and we wanted to, um, we realized that most of the Kettle River in the Granby is privately owned. So we're kind of in the conservation world and we're like, wow, all these species depend on, like the Lewis's woodpecker, depend on riparian areas to thrive. And that's all dependent on the habitat, which you guys own, um, right in front of your places on the riverfront. So it's, it's extremely important in that sense. But that's kind of why we, we went down this path learning about our rivers and the habitat. And we had to do a private landowner outreach project. So we wrote about 100 letters. Maybe some of you guys got a letter from me about the Lewis's woodpecker. <coughs> We got to do some site visits to folks and just go to their riverfront and look at issues and habitat and whatnot. So that's why I kind of went down this road and why it's important to me. And um, I'm gonna know a little bit. So just a quick why riparian zone 101 here. You got the your stream channel or river, right? And then the riparian area is just on the outside of that, that transition zone between the terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystems. It's unique to that area. The vegetation looks a little bit different than the upland, the lowland, but this is the area we're, we're talking about. 
Um, the high water mark. I did. We were talking about this. Is, this is more towards lake. I did say river in here. We're talking about this definition, river stream. But um, yeah, high water mark is is you'll see this language in the permitting application too. So the high water mark is that distinct area um, <coughs> or bank full where above it, um, at least here, it's private property. In most cases, I know there were some different cases, but below that high water mark, it's crown land, it's public. No one is allowed to touch it. And it is public free for fishermen to walk down as well, right? Like, so that's that area. Um, so how do you define that though in a year like this year where all of Johnson's flats was <laughs> under the high water? I know, so right? <laughs> yeah, well that's that's flood water it's and normal <coughs> high water mark. So yeah, he was talking about the normal high water mark and the Q2 or the one in 200 year event or the one in 500 year event is outside of that normal range. Yeah the average year where, where you can, yeah. And sometimes in, in cases where it's like, so we have right perinary regulations in other parts of the province where they're not allowed to develop within 30 meters, nothing, no vegetation, nothing, within 30 meters of the river. Mostly where there's salmon, and they usually get, you know, there's a lot more stipulation, we usually get like a qualified environmental professional to go and actually designate those areas too when there's really fine lines between where development happens and stuff. Um, so that's, that's a good, whoops, we want to know. Um, so yeah, just to cut a little slide on the other critters, right, that that's why it's not no, it's, it's no light thing to hand out permits for, for, for stuff when you're influencing habitat as well, right? So there's a couple of the critters, like there's the Lewis's woodpecker up there, City of Ground Forks has the highest density of Lewis's nesting in the whole country here, right? And, right so it's about 10% of the provincial population. A little tiger salamander, they really, be, really depend on foraging areas and riparian areas, and you've got the common bergansers, and of course the rainbow trout, which our rivers are so uh, unique for. Uh, Terra White, our fisheries biologist, often says like there is no river anywhere else in the province like the Kettle, and we have to <coughs> really make sure that we treat it well for our fishery values as well. The trout, trout unlimited folks go crazy in Kelowna for the Kettle River. They give money and everything. And, wild they really um, so this is um this is the Granby River so the Granby River up in the provincial park so no human influences from this point above right all rivers no matter what any water stream you put they all want to they all want to meander you cannot make a river go straight there's this engineering study that's really popular with young engineers and they put a sand table or like marble sand table out, right? And they, they have a hose or something or like a stream of water. And at first it goes straight for like a little bit, but something always happens and the river starts to meander. Always, always, always. Um, so outside of bends, this is the active erosion side. You can see here. And these, depo these, these deposits that come from the outside bend are actually important for habitat downstream. They contribute to the sediment, which in some cases, believe it or not, you do want. Um, and then you have the, the other side, so the growing side on the inside of the bend. These are the sides that grow, so they accrete vegetation and gravel and stuff. It's where the slow water is and it drops things and that process can happen. If you, if you have any questions along the way or comments or shout outs, please, please do. Um, so this is Grand Forks. In 1951, you can see um, old river channels here. You can see massive wetland here, all the, the riparian connection through here. And um, this is now where like Interfor sits, right? And um, yeah, confluence. Um, you can see old, old, there's an old river channel there too. And yeah, so. Was it filled in for Interfor? Yes. Oh. Or, or no, not for Interfork, right? But I guess it would have been oh, oh, Open Talbot, right? Well, yes, I mean, there, there yeah. was a fairgrounds it's down below fair. where Camp Bar yeah, and uh, Roxel were. There was a big yeah. fairgrounds over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. There was never any industry there. Right, right. Except the boundary sawmill over there. Yeah, yeah. Really, really neat to look at. We did a right parent threat assessment and we did some comparisons about loss of vegetation along the rivers and stuff. And uh, of course, there's 
but a lot of development, right, in Grant Forks, right? Rock Creek didn't change a whole lot, like it's been agriculture historically for quite a while, but it's, the, it's urban development, it's really impacted these areas. Um, so, you know, in foresight, if we could just know what's gonna happen and plan a little bit better, right? Um, Graham Bruno, you probably know this picture. This is up, I know my neighbors up there, James, but this is um, just by Miller Creek. This is what happened before, like this was a while, how many years ago did this, it was like? Oh, six, yeah. Six, six years ago. No, in 2006. Oh, in 2006, <coughs> sorry, so yeah, Big River Bend, the road, you can see the old road go, they had to reroute it. And with this year's flood, it, all, all of that vegetation is gone. They had to move one of the power poles across the road too. Um, and next year, I can't, I, 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 they gotta do something with that road, I'm assuming, because next year, if it's a big flood again, the road will go again. So planning is always a, a good thing, foresight, right? Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> oh, ah! thank you. <laughs> I don't even know this, right? <laughs> 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 okay. um, but of course, you know, like, so what, right? But I, my heart goes out with everyone who's lost stuff. And it's, it's not fun losing fence lines and property damage and stuff. It's, yeah, I live on the Gravity River too, right? So I, I'm also nervous about it. But um, yeah, major, major property damage can happen if we can't, we don't have the foresight for these things. This is uh, the conservation properties, the Boothmans. Um, so a lot of field damage. I know up in the in the west boundary as well. Lots of folks had a lot of field damage, so that's impacting their their livelihood. Right? It's it's pretty crazy. Um, and you know things that I don't like to show houses, so it's <laughs> either so blocked out, probably just a private seat, right? But. So this is an incident on the kettle, and look at this hundred-year-old barn is back there, and he's, it's never been touched by water. And recent folks moved upstream, and they cut away all the cottonwoods. And you know, it was a, of course it was a crazy event this year, but first time ever this barn was impacted in a hundred years by flood water. The property owners like eh, maybe the neighbors could have left those cottonwoods to protect a little bit better, maybe right. Um, Oh, that's this, me. This is, uh, <laughs> this is Muriel and Gary's house. I didn't get yes, permission to just show this picture, yeah. but yeah, Muriel is a great steward. Um, she's helped us on some restoration projects and stuff and learning how to plant cottonwoods. Like, I'm not naive, like a couple cottonwoods, right? Like, Muriel had about 15 mature cottonwoods. Lewis is woodpeckers mm -hmm. breeding, about 15 feet of of water. 35 lost, 35 feet. 35 feet lost, right? So this is what this is what Muriel's dealing with for next year, right? Like no, nope, nope. Premier's gonna fix it up. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Let us know when you get the chat. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Scary stuff. Scary oh, screw stuff. If it happens, yes. if like it happens again. Yeah. yeah. And that's it. Um, so people want to do things and put things on the riverbank, of course, to stop this, right? Do the blank of the picture to get this. Probably wasn't done under permit, I can see. <laughs> um, there's, you know, we see tires along the river, rock that's put down, and it can have downstream impacts. And that's why we need to make sure that it's done right if we're going to do it. And you can also impact yourself and you don't even know it, right? If you have a couple stretches, one stretch is not running, you put in a bunch of riprap, maybe it'll speed up the water and like water's of course the issue when it seeps, but it's water velocity is the problem with erosion. Not so much water, it's the it's the velocity and we want those rough surfaces along the river. Um, that's what slows down the water. We don't want those hard edges. The, that can actually speed up the water. So if you think of it like overall, like the whole river system, and you know, we and we definitely don't want to end up like let's say this the the Okanagan River tubing down that <laughs> channel. The have you guys seen it? I don't know. It's ugly. It's ugly. It's <laughs> terrible, right? So we need to try and you know think about these big pictures. And if you don't, you know, this is a massive riprap project and. You know the riprap ends and then there's major impacts like right after the 
riprap, whether it's you know cause and effect or not, but it's it, it wasn't done there and yeah, it's just there's 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 other impacts that riprap can cause downstream right? So we really have to be aware of that. Um, yeah, that's the theory about why we got to get hit so bad is because that pile of riprap was put there the day before the crest. Right. That right. is a theory on. Yeah, yeah, you never you never know. And then, you know, we like I said, we've been doing working on these restoration projects a bit and trying to get cottonwoods to grow and you know, I'm not naive, like I said, I know there's situations where cottonwoods are vegetation is not gonna work, like maybe mural situation oh, now, right? Try. I know, um, but... Um, you gotta water it? Oh yeah, yeah. You're gonna try there, to but there's other threats, like within it. the city of Grand Forks, and I don't really wanna bring up the deer issue, but I did an exposure mm -hmm. around um, a property that I've been working on re restoration-wise, and this is a shrub, what it looks like inside the exposure, no deer, and you can't, there's a, there's a shrub right here, you can't quite make out because it's got zero leaves on it and it's dying outside of the exposure, but they're the same height. Like deer really have an impact on our on our vegetation, especially in town. They're just, you know, it's a natural process. We have the cottonwoods, they fall into the water, they create awesome fish habitat for a while until a flood and comes and takes it away. And um, when that cottonwood falls, five replace it and start to grow. Um, it's the ecological process, but we have these deer now that are so many in such high densities that they're not letting any cottonwoods or shrubs grow into this, into our riparian areas. And beavers. And yeah. we know about the beavers. Um, so when we do our, yeah, it's crazy when we do our frustration projects, right? Like, it kind of looks like an industrial zone when we walk away. We've got the, <coughs> the cardboard for the invasive grasses. We've got the rodent protection. We've got the plant. We've got the deer protection and future deer, deer protection. It is not cheap process either. It's cheaper than riprap, but um, yeah, it's uh, um, yeah. And you can use things like dormant dormant stakes, dormant cottonwoods. You take a dormant a dormant uh, main trunk and you plug it in the ground, and these things can can grow, right? But there's the there's the there's the threat such as deer and stuff that can prevent this stage from happening. Um, this is where you'll really recognize this. This is what a project oh, we did yeah. on the kettle behind the flour mill where we used some bioengineering techniques to stabilize a steep south-facing slope that's all crumbling. There's some graves at risk up there and that's why we took on this project. Um, and we did these waddles along here. I mean, the kettle's a big system, so some of these won't work in areas, but this is an outside of the bend, and this is after the flood. So it all did survive, which we are pretty happy about. Um, the biggest damage that happened to this was three days after we installed, and a beaver yeah. <laughs> came and took a whole bunch of And the key to that was it's south-facing, and it was watered. It was watered. Yeah, we, there's a definite, Pat Horkoff is a definite champion for this site, like yeah. amazing guy uh, watering it all the time and stuff, but probably almost done with watering it. It's probably free growing almost by now, but kind of neat. So yeah, and then it, there have been more answers or questions about <coughs> this, I'm sure, but so you come up with your plan, your idea, right? And then this is the uh, website you go to for your um, change approval or notification where you want to do something underneath the high water mark um, and you have to get your plans together and then you apply to Christine and this is the process and I, I know Nicole could go through this a bit more if you wanted to or whatever but um, this is this is where you go um, but moving forward you kind of like identify your project support. Like I said, like I've been doing this with the Lewis's Woodpecker and there's been special base money and this and that and try and think outside of the box. Like riprap is extremely expensive as some of you might have already found out, right? It's crazy and who can afford that by themselves and maybe you can, which is great, but it's extremely expensive. And, um, uh, some of these other techniques might work in spots might not, but um, try and identify your land values and where they are and the agricultural values and just and your home values. Identify partners, um, your neighbors, see if you can work together. Um, local government, of course, you're on board and storage groups can help out. Um, 
we have been, and then your your notification approvals and, and trying. Yeah, everyone's worried about getting it done right <coughs> next by next flood. And go. I don't know if it's this is last year's. Oh, yes, working. Last year's flood and it just 2017. This is but you can see where the trees are. You can see the main stem and where the trees are. It really does slow down that water. It slows it down, and that's what you want. Um, all those soft edges that are, and that's when it can slow down erosion and stuff. So if you do have any healthy riparian areas left around your place, like treat it like gold. Um, I really recommend that. Um, it's it's really important for your own property and for and for your surrounding neighbors' property and, and stuff. Um, I've, I've got a comment. We have uh, this little island area right beside us, and uh, this year, with so much debris coming down, it basically wiped out about 30 trees right off this one area. And what's happening is, as the debris comes down, it gets caught up into there, and it actually puts more pressure and breaks more trees. So we said, well, what we should do is do a channel so this stuff can keep going. But then somebody said, no, you can't do that because it's trees, it's riparian, and all of that. So, you know, when you, when I see trees right along the bank, I said, that's great. But when you have an island that's catching every log that's coming down the cattle, uh, maybe it's not a good thing. Yeah, and you know, debris form debris. Debris and log jams do form naturally right in these certain areas, but in that behind the flower mill, that's what was happening. A debris, you know, a log jam got stuck up on that island. You know where I'm talking, right behind the flower mill, right? It was there for a while, and of course, it would divert the water right into that slope bank, and that's what was causing it to unravel at the bottom and uh, coming down. This year, um, that there's a, that little island there too. It got cut in half, and uh, but the the log jam is entirely gone now, which is interesting. It's been there for years and years and years, right? And uh, but um, if anybody, you know, like I still work on these other projects for the nonprofit, and if you if you want me to come out to your to your land and have a look and have a look with questions and help form a plan, and we're working on things with Nicole and. Mike here and, and we really want to offer that too and it's not just for it's for you but it's for other values as I showed as well right like to make sure it's done right and I, I yeah really promote that and, but if you want to get in touch with me I know it's really small there but um there's an email address and I know um Nicole's got my email and and phone number and stuff like please get in touch and I can come and have a look I know there's some properties that are a little bit more you know difficult than others and you will need an engineer um to come and help you out in some of these designs right it's not uh yeah yeah definitely in some of these it's like your place and right and i don't know if you've talked to the lady for trees now yeah absolutely and i lost about 12 of them when yeah. i stopped stopping yeah yeah so jenny yes who's, who's going to pay for the uh engineer and all of this I mean that's that's the problem that is the you problem. know we we haven't won the lottery yet yeah so that's it that's an issue in itself but I mean so we're talking about hiring an engineer getting the riprap and you know copious and copious amounts of hours uh, people are working that type of thing how like I just you know, I, I really appreciate all the information that you've given. Mm -hmm. uh, what I hear is that on the river to stabilize it, you know, adding vegetation and things like that, but it needs to be watered. Well, in a lot of cases, that's not possible. You know, I mean, we're talking kilometers of a river bank that doesn't have water. There's water in the river. But to get it up, like, I mean, that's... Well, I know we've set up watering systems at some of our sites with big, tidy tanks watering them and stuff and drip irrigation. I know you think you didn't have to, won't have to water plants by the river, but those roots aren't deep enough yet unless you use some dormant stakes that you can get down further enough into the, into the water table and stuff. And then but the river goes down. Um, even the river goes down <laughs> and it's out of the, the water table. Yeah, and but if you don't, I mean, and plant a tree, long -term. I mean, <coughs> a tree takes at least, what, 10 to 15 years 
before to develop oh, a good so root system, I would think, that's the gonna do value. Yeah. So we're, I think what we, we kind of want answers now. Like yeah. this is good for the future, but what are we gonna do now? So maybe that's an opportunity to, if you're done. I am, and, and I might run out. out. So yeah, if anybody does want to get a hold of me, unless there's any questions, I'm going to uh, bow out. A birthday party to get to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jenny. Yeah. She takes her kids all the time. Anything, any place they've ever been where Jenny is, she's always got a little one on her uh, back. No way. Thank you. Yeah. Nice so, I've got just a tiny bit to say. Um, Jim Guido, I retired from Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations uh, a year ago, April. Uh, I came back two days a week on this project just to support primarily the facilitation and liaison between municipalities and regional district and what we're calling team government because there's there's regional operations and Victoria branch operations. The regional operations are primarily Crown Park, but there's also a, uh, an Elson office that supports it. So I'm, I'm not a subject matter expert. I'm, I'm good at government. I worked for 35 years with government, and, and I, I, I know the connections. And so my role is, is a liaison or a facilitation between between the, uh, the municipality, regional district, and those those operational people like Christina, who will introduce herself here shortly, and do a presentation. Um, so, so I'm committed to this project for a couple days a week, uh, and so a couple comments. One is, if you have not been involved in the the biweekly public meetings where the broader uh, Boundary Flood Recovery Team makes presentations, and I encourage you to, to participate in that. This is this particular forum is a small piece of that bigger forum, and there's, there's both a recovery team that's got the five programs of economy, environment, infrastructure, uh, housing, and, and uh, well, personal needs, wellness. And there's, there's a mirrored group of people from government that have uh, representatives within those same five categories. And the, I've, got, I've got an org chart here, and people have tried to, they thought of putting it up on the board, but it never shows up as far as the detail on a screen. So if, if anybody wants to, to just have a real quick look at what that organization looks like, then, then come and grab it after, I don't have copies, but, but take a look at it afterwards. So, um, that, so, so get involved in those bigger, uh, bigger meetings. You'll, you'll, you'll get a broader understanding of this, of this recovery initiative. Um, What's there funding for it? Funding is a huge part of the discussions. And, <laughs> the discussions. Yeah, and, and it takes time. There's, we have, uh, I was on a call this morning, and that program really, really does have the support of government. Uh, there's, there's a number of funding sources, um, federal ones, uh, provincial ones, there's, there's different federal programs, there's resourcing from, from all of us that are supporting the recovery and part of those discussions. And, and there's a lot of Victorian people there and they do support it and decisions are trying to be made as soon as they can. So I encourage you to get involved with that on the website um, if you're not connected to that, then get connected because it's it's a grassroots, locally driven organization that's part of provincial government and and from my opinion it's 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 good. So getting down to this um, this small piece um, in a liaison role, um, I know I know the people to talk to. Um, I'm going to connect. The individual questions to the people, the subject matter experts. Um, I've got a uh, uh, an attempt. I've got the regional district working on a mapping project. That that when we talk about bundling applications, it would be really nice to to have some dots on maps where there's concerns and starting to to understand because there's there's segments of crime. There's there's 
groups of private land and to have a visual of that on a, a pre-application awareness. Um, I'm, I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there, but I have this vision that that would certainly help us. So, um, we need the whole watershed. The yeah, watershed. Kettle River, all the way up. <coughs> Yep, Travis with uh, Regional District <coughs> is, is on supporting that program. He's working on that now. Travis think, Mitchell? Uh, no, Travis Arnold. Arnold. Okay. Yep. Uh, GIS guy, a magician with the uh, yeah. with the electronic system. So, so that is something that we will will try to get the scope of the issue. Uh, Christina will talk about individual applications, but but what I'm going to try and facilitate is getting that bigger picture and. Who's a neighbor of who, and is it crown land between, or is it private land, and, and just that whole matrix. Uh, so, so that's something I've taken on, and hopefully within, I would say within a week, I'll have something that we can start dotting. That map that they have already has the yellow and red dotted properties on it, so, so they're starting to know which properties are impacted. Jim, yes. you were talking about the bigger picture. Uh, we're, I'm certainly anxious to see, and I'm assuming a whole bunch of other people are here, to see the hydrologist report that is apparently at City Council, but yes, it's for whatever reason, it's locked up tight in the bull's ass of fly time and nobody's seen it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a particular reason why it is? Uh, because there are major decisions to be made around that, and they're just not prepared to, to, uh, to, to have that report out without them getting their mind around it. And I think how long would it take them to get their mind around things? It's a great question. You were there yesterday. It's yeah, a it great question for that group. We're having that meeting every two weeks. So, so let's get down to these in-stream applications. Uh, that's my general uh, liaison role. Is I'll try and get a map and try and get dots on maps <coughs> for where these individual concerns are and how connected they are. And that's that's something I'm. Well, if we saw that report, we might have a better idea what our next step is. That would be then. Then we could talk to you. Depending uh, on where we stand on that hydrologist report. Yeah, and it's not re it's not ready, and we do not want to stop and wait. Uh, we want people to understand the process and get applications in, so that so that these things can be moving forward together. Yes. So, so my home's not on the river. However, my home was impacted by the water that came through our whole neighborhood. So. For someone like me, I wouldn't be putting in an application to berm or protect erosion on my property necessarily. Okay. But being that I'm in an area that my la my neighbors lands, if water comes up over their properties, it does impact me. So, what are options for people like me? Uh, just knowledge, knowing what, knowing the morphology, how streams <coughs> behave, and. And yeah, what they but look that doesn't like now. protect my home, right, or my property. So all I can do essentially is just encourage them, those yep. landowners, yep. to come and, and deal. With can we? Do we, as a neighborhood, need to work together, or Absol will it be individual applications? Uh, absolutely, uh, clumping, grouping of applications is something we're recommending. Absolutely, work together with your neighbors, whether they're the last neighbor between you and the water or whether they're upstream downstream so that will come out we're absolutely encouraging the grouping of applications we'll talk in general terms about about studies and supporting documentation is, for is for there the someone a representative who would come to our neighborhood and help us as a group put that together yes okay. yep. don't know what that looks like don't know who it might be, but but and like I say, it probably won't be me. But somebody <coughs> from regional operations at the appropriate time uh, will be looking at certainly at groups of applications, certainly on on the mapping products, but in the field. And, and I'll just tag Christina to answer that question when she gets up and does her. And is there sort of a time frame that this is going to be happening in? As soon as we possibly can, but nothing, not not a deadline. This is. This is going to be a continuing process for numbers of months, if not years. Has anybody not filled this out? Because this would help with the dots on the map. So that's all I am. Um, 
looking at the time clock, so uh, I have some cards up front. If you've got some general questions, absolutely take my card, my email, my phone number is there. Or, uh, grab a card and uh, and then any questions you've got, we can try to help. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to that, yeah. and then you can. Do you, you want to set up? Sure. Or, yeah. Um, okay. So hearing hearing a couple hearing a couple of comments, I, I was going to um, going to allow Christina to, to do her, her her talk first, but um, I, I feel like this is important to to talk about right now, just based on on the comments that that have been brought up. So um, in talking about putting together the application. Uh, we're doing um, a bit of a dry run of me going through the application for the first time in the whole process and hiring the people that, that we need to, to make the uh, to make the plans and go through the application process. So we're doing it at McCray Creek and so far it's, um, it's, it's looking like it's going to cost between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars for the application. So this is this is a huge barrier and we acknowledge it and it's the, the application process is, is, is very is, is very onerous and talking to the province about it we, we wanted to eliminate barriers for people to do these works and this was one of the major ones because if we don't eliminate this barrier it's encouraging people to do illegal works and when you do illegal works you're you're likely to cause more damage than, than you're saving so what we've done is uh, we've, we've got buy-in from the province and the, the funding application is is in the works and the province is supportive of us putting a team together that would go out to your to your places and um, and, and do the analysis for you. Um, we would be court. Ideally, people would get together in neighborhoods and uh, and along the riverbanks and, and talk with your neighbors about about th these kind of protections that you're thinking about. And then when there's when when we start coordinating that a little bit better, we'll come in with the team and we'll do assessments based on. Uh, we're going to try to see as many as we can, but the priority ones for, for protecting the most homes and the most property is, is what we're going to be looking for. So we're, we're, we're in the works, there's, there's, there's support for this effort, and what we really want to do is take the burden off you as much as possible and put it on to the, the big brains that are going to be doing all this work. So we, I hope that's a little bit of comfort for, for folks and that it's a little bit of good news, finally, that that we are in, we are getting it done, and we're we're having we're having the experts that are going to be able to have a look have a look at your properties. So, so does that mean we ought to just hold off on submitting applications then until we get an assessment? No. What? No. Well, <laughs> Christina, I think I think you were you were saying earlier it's it's ideal to to get to yeah. get applications kind of on the books. Okay. Um, they can be they can be modified as we go forward, and then and then. Ideally, we're we're submitting as groups and not and not individuals because that'll drastically limit the amount of work that they have to do and limit the amount of cost that we would have to spend looking at stretches of river, as well as provide some some benefits for having a having a broader view of stretches of river. And can I can I just sort of jump in sure. on there? So yeah, thank you. That was that was excellent. It's really going to be case by case. So if you, somebody says, you know what, I've got the small little piece of property not really too much affecting get your application in you're looking at a spot and saying we're going to potentially have somebody come in it's a big stretch they're all tied together you might be waiting the week they letting us know what's coming in so i think a big one is the communication the more we can sorry i'm kind of hiding behind there the more we can let people know that it's coming the better so if i know that i've got uh, i'm going to make something a kilometer of a stretch of work coming in at me I can prep people to know, guess what, this is going to be coming in, it's going to be coming in soon. Um, can you give me something? Can you give me the, the what, where their point A to point B is, giving me something that I can prep. Fisheries are coming in, First Nations consultations. So we've got a variety of different groups that have to all look at each of the applications. Somebody else may say, I've got a small piece of property, um, I'm not being affected, I'm looking at the bioengineering or I'm looking at the, some of the tree work, the riparian work, let's get that one in. Let's, Let's get it moving. So it's a really a case by case basis. Um, that file means I've also left my card in the back table. Um, <laughs> I know, I just noticed that. <laughs> I don't know where my card is. Uh, but the card is around here somewhere. And uh, but yeah, give us a shout, give me an email and, and sort of helping me help us figure that one out. 
Wow. Oh, just a quick question. Yeah. Does it help if we send with the application uh, pictures? Like, if yes. we snap pictures and say, okay, this is what we want to do. Yes. How do we do this? Does that help? Oh my gosh, it helps so much. Um, that, as well as the other thing I see a lot of people doing, is they'll send a photo and it could be Google Earth, and they've just taken one of those red Sharpie markers. People have done it with whiteout. They've, they've printed off the Google map, they've whited it out, and they've gone into a government office and said, do something with this, I need to put this on my application. Like, they're, you know, they're, they're certainly aware of the fact that not everybody has, has got the paint programs figured out in the computers, so there's a lot of different ways. I know a lot of people have taken photos and then have just said, this is the point that I'm going to be doing the work from. This is where my slope is. So in this presentation, and I'm going to move through some of the slides a bit fast on it because some of it's like, hey, look at the Section 11 terminology. And I don't think you guys really want to see it too much. But um, but yeah, we speak a little bit about that. But yeah, photos are great. A photo allows me to look at it and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oh, I definitely see where she's saying that high watermark is. Um, I see, I see that information that you're saying, so yeah, hugely. This okay, sorry, I, I will hit everyone's questions. So, about two years ago, I contacted somebody in Vernon okay. that does these permitting. Okay. And the guy told me that I had to get a geotech engineer, I had to get an environmental engineer, I had to do a schedule and all of those things, I said, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead. But then I really had a problem finding anybody locally that could do that work. Okay. And so if there was a list of people that are qualified to do these kinds of work, yeah. and you can give them to the applicants, because yeah. if you say we need to do all this engineering work, yeah. uh, there's gonna be costs in trying to get somebody local, because I don't wanna bring somebody from Prince George to try to look at so something down here. I know, I know. So, so the problem is, you know, and are you going to be asking for all these engineering studies? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through, make sure that I answer all the questions. Some of that's in this presentation. Okay. So let me, I, I, I will hit you, sir, at the back because I know that you're, you got a question. But I, I would like to also go through this because some of this, and and also while I'm doing the presentation, by all means, ask the questions because. I know for myself, I always, at the end of the presentation, like, I had a great question, but I don't remember what it is anymore. So by all means, ask the questions. I will definitely try to keep us on track to the focus of the application process. Um, and you've got our cards, you've got our information, so you're certainly well to, uh, welcome to ask outside of that. But I, I will try to keep this presentation on track to that application process. Yes? Okay, my question is, most of the firms, whatever, Night will be on private property. Yeah. So is there going to be a need for license occupations or easements that sort of thing? Oh, so, um, so when you put a berm or a dike on a private property and it's just on that one private property, so you're not crossing pit lines. So, so I, I'm talking Johnson Black. Our concerns will be probably. Oh, like the, the government's building a dike. Is that what you're asking yeah, about? Yeah. And yeah. so you're wondering whether or not they're gonna want to get easements from the private property owners in relation to the dike that they're building. Right. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I got the question. Uh, yeah, I have. I have no idea. That's gonna be. That's gonna be coming through the regional district. And I think. I think the first bet would be let's figure out what the plans of all those options for the hydrological um, options uh, are. Still a cost involved to doing that. Yeah. Oh, for figuring out the easements. Oh, I'm getting the uh, sort of thing. There's lawyers involved. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't want the other side. That's I wrote it down. I don't Perfect. know the answer either. Yeah. It's a, it's a worthy question. Excellent. Is there any other questions before I start? Just a quick question. So the DFA is nothing to do with this? Okay. So disaster financial assistance is a totally different process. There's no 90-day limit on this? for expiry after the events or no. anything like that? Okay. No, so this is this is a process that happens, it's not in my presentation, good work. <laughs> this is a process that, uh, that happens every time you're working and I'll, and I'll show that below top of bank and the high water mark areas um, across the province. So just like Jenny was mentioning, uh, whenever you've got that, that water component, usually it's crown um, and so if you're covered in that, then you need to have a <coughs> through the province. So yeah, it doesn't have a time limit. The other one that I want 
to mention that I didn't mention also in the presentation is um, we can give these permits for multiple years. So once you're through, you could end up having that same permit now for a couple of years. We're never going to go after you and say you didn't do you didn't do all the work you did. You said you were going to do in the first year. That that's you. That's that's yours. So no one's at you now that the permit's been issued. Um, when we start doing a, a stream reach and we're looking at that big picture, there may be some of that going in, going, ooh, we need to get part of this done in order to protect the other property. So there might be some of that, but the provincial government um, isn't going to go after that. And so you do have that multiple year permits. Yes? So this isn't exactly a permit question, but being that Down at Johnson's Flats, yeah. it's all private property. Yeah. Are the private property owners expected to pay for the diking, or will there be funding to help with that? So again, you're talking about the, the local government diking that, that you're thinking I on, or are you talking about private property it, it's diking? It's all on private property down there. Yeah. It's, yeah, so would private property owners be expected to pay for, if dikes are approved, would they be expected to pay for that, or would there be provincial or federal money for that? So I am outside of the funding. Uh, that's not what I'm dealing with. So this is just the permitting. Um, the diking, an official dike under the Dike Maintenance Act has its own qualifications, and there's only certain people that can have an official dike under the Dike Maintenance Act, that, and that covers large swaths of, of pits. So like uh, 10 different properties. So the pit is your identifier number in your property, you'll see well, they'd all need to be done down there. You couldn't just do three properties. It's the whole thing. Right. So that that's going to be, yeah. I, I would think that just based on the conversations that I've had with some of the recovery folks is that that's a substantial amount of work that's going to be done. Mm -hmm. And either the region or the city or combination of both would, would take that on. Uh, that would be that would be my that would be my guess. I'm, I'm not 100% sure about it, but I would I would think that that would that would, those are the kind of discussions that are happening is how is how to protect these areas you cannot actually dave, dave is for the for the city maybe he's got a oh. foot on it oh <laughs> he's or, or, he's yeah. 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 or maybe he's got a question what's that right, um, <laughs> so if it was an approved uh and registered dike it has to be to um like a local government or it's just a society about to say or that. whatever yeah so uh, there would need to be, um, with the local government, there would need to be land ownership uh, to, to create that dike for funding. So there's there's quite a process to go through to uh, create a dike that's not there right now. So the registered dikes that the city owns, the uh, applications are different than creating new ones. And so the big one here too, um, and we'll speak a little bit in the presentation, is the definition of a deck. And I've heard a lot of people saying, I have a deck on my property, it's under mine and I'm looking to fix it. Um, the Dike Management Act, which is what you're speaking about, has got a definition of what a deck is, so that's covering multiple properties. It does need to be managed by a local government, well, local government. I think private property owners can get together, but they have to create a society and then it would be not funded through uh, the province. So, yeah. It would be not funded through it the wouldn't, province? It wouldn't be. So who yeah. would fund it? Private property owners then? The owners, yeah. Good question for the broader recovery committee. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to do... I got one, one question. Who looks after the roads? From Gilpin all the way to Atwood, if you go down there, there's a couple of sinkholes, and okay. MCON comes along and pours, you know, a meter of, uh, of, of uh, yeah. asphalt in there, rolls over it, and then a week later, it's a foot down. Something's happening under that section of road in at least two spots, and who's going to who's going to come in there? Because next year, I mean, there's obviously been some undermining. And I've, as a kid, I've watched the Columbia River take away, you know, whole sections of highway. And uh, I think that who's responsible for that? I mean, it's some transportation and so that should, <laughs> should one of us notify them? Yep. Yeah, you can contact sure. Ministry of Transportation, give them the location of the sinkholes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, by all means. Okay, this is my last question, then I got to start the presentation. I just want to double check if we understood correctly. So, say in Johnson Flats, we're talking about, you know, protecting everyone. So, an extended stretch right now, it's all private property. They have an option of 
becoming a society and trying to pay for it themselves, or if somehow the city owned right next to the river, they have an option of applying for a dike. Is that correct? But it has to be city property to build a dike? For, for local government to get funding, uh, they have to, to try to uh, attain uh, ownership of the land. How much land? 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 Just how how just, much just land? <laughs> so is that an option for us where we live? I think that's, that's a question for the broader recovery group. I, that, it's, it's that's at a that. much higher level. I don't know too much about the community societies for dike making, dike building, but I can certainly look into it a bit more. Maybe we'll so start the presentation, yeah. just cognizant of the time. Christine, you keep using the term pit. What, what, what is that? I have no parcel idea. Identity. Oh, oh PID. PID. Like PIT. Uh, PID. Parcel identifier. Oh. ID. Identifier. ID identifier. Okay, I'm like, what's the oh, D? Okay. All right. And so, yeah, a PID number is, um, so every property has its own separate number. Yes. So you don't have anyone in BC that has the same pro parcel identifier number. So if your property you. gets, I apologize, um, if your property gets subdivided, you will then have two par parcel, parcel identifier numbers. Yes. I and they'll be new. I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, sorry about that. I um, I run off pins. <laughs> Steel pins. All right. So like I said, I'll sort of move through some of this a little, little, that, little fast here. But so I'm Christina Anderson, uh, water stewardship officer, based out of the Cranbrook office. I'm going to be working in the Kootenai, in the Nelson region, and working here, associating, helping up with these the flood. Uh, approvals and some of the flood work and really any support we can give for the section 11s the applications and a lot of that process the provincial side processing of how we can move forward with hopefully the most support that we can give you guys through this process um, and so this is the water sustainability act so it's uh, these if they're called section 11s uh, what we have for our regulations is uh, every one of the different sections has got its own number this happens to be section 11 of the regulation that says everybody needs to have uh, a permit to be able to work in that water channel that we were talking about beforehand. Uh, in the section 11, so I'm just going to look at a little bit about the <coughs> legislation. I will not stay on that very long. This was done a little bit for something, another project, so we'll move through it. But um, I actually really like talking about legislation. So if anybody wants to talk about <laughs> legislation, I know. And I, I remember when I first came to government, I can't believe people actually reference sections, and now I catch myself referencing sections all the time. Um, so yeah, don't hesitate coming and speaking to me and saying I don't understand this process of it. Yes? Is this online? This PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Oh, um, no. But, uh, and I'm, in that I'm about to move through a couple of the slides a little fast, I feel a bit bad if it goes online, but I will certainly give it to Mike for sure. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. So the legislation is online. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, if you wanted to go back and look at the legislation, it's certainly there. It might take a little bit of dancing to get there, but it's there. Oh, yeah. This takes the, the legislation's <laughs> online. <laughs> this takes the dancing away, though, right? Oh, you're, 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 you have all the legislation that's relevant to it. I do, yeah. Well, well if um, if you put an email address on that on that contact sheet, um, I can I can forward it on when, when Christina sends it my way. So the, the other thing I guys think is a question. Okay, perfect. Let me give me just a second. The other thing is, is and I'll speak to you a little just a second here. There, I did do an info sheet, an information sheet, and so it has a whole bunch of the different websites that might be relevant. Some of them you're gonna say, oh, that's not relevant to my property at all. <coughs> Some of them are quite that you might see. I believe I've got the Water Sustainability Act website to get to it. So that's one of the handouts that we've got somewhere that were right with the cards before. Yes. Then uh, Johnson's Flats at the south, where, where, where the big power line runs from east to west. South of the power line is a regional district. And the, the upper part is the city. Now, how do you handle that together? For the diking? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how to do it. That's something that we'll, we'll leave to let the, we'll sort of start figuring out what the options are, the big picture options, um, and how we're going to be progressing with some of that in terms of the city diking process. 
So that, those kinds of questions will get answered as time progresses with what the big picture plan is. But those, that's not a, that's not a hard, that wouldn't be a showstopper. The regional districts might be able to apply. Regional districts are allowed to, yes. Okay. Yeah, so that that itself, the, the division of that land wouldn't be wouldn't be a stop in the program. Yeah. Okay, so in um, the two sections, the two things that you are you may need with doing some of this work would be a section ten and a section eleven. A section ten is whenever you pull water out of a groundwater source, your well, or out of a creek or a stream or any surface water source, you need a permit for it. Uh, so if you've got um, a lot, who here has a water license? Right, so great. So these are in perpetuity. So these are licenses for a long period of time. If you're, let's say you're doing, um, they had to do some uh, compaction work and you needed to get some water in to get the water to compact the ground, this may require a second permit of a section 10. So just keeping that in mind, if the water is coming from a four inch pump that you've just thrown in the river, you do need to have a permit associated with that. Um, and then the section 11s is what we're gonna be speaking with. A couple of the other acts that you'll hear every once in a while, what we'll talk about is that Dyke Maintenance Act. We've spoken a bit about that. So that's got some very specific definitions. So that's the, the cool part that I think about some of these regulations and legislations is that it is all defined. And so by having those definitions, that's what, when I look at what you're at, you're giving me or you're asking, I will go back to our act to see how does it work within our legislation and our, our, our regulations. It allows for that transparency, go on the internet and get the same information I get, it allows for that consistency. And so that's sort of where we're coming in. And so those are just a couple more of the acts, dam safety regulation or that groundwater. So they're just a couple of acts that we may, be, we may be looking into. But most of the stuff that you'll be dealing with will be that section 11 changes in and about a stream. So what is a change in and about a stream? So it's, this is that legislation part. So this is just saying um, anytime you're doing that work below that top bank or below that high water mark, you do need to have a permit to work in that channel from the province. When do you need a permit? This is usually the question that I get asked rather regularly. As a standard for rivers, it's top of bank to top of bank. For lakes, it's that natural, normal high water mark. The question came up, <laughs> that was a nod, um, but now are we working with Q100, Q200? I'm gonna have to get back to you on that, actually, and it was an interesting question, and. That spoke is the same. That's the same line with your berm question. How far? How far back are we going in in for the permitting? So that's something that. And how would I get back to on that type of an answer? Is that something I can give you, Mike, and you're able to relay that information? Just because yeah. I think there's going to be a lot more people. Like I certainly can speak to you directly, but I think there's going to be a lot more people that are. That are really interested in that in that answer, but I thought that was a that was a great answer. Yeah, I would suggest that we'll use the use the website possibly as <coughs> the information sheet with general context. Mm -hmm. I think that might be an opportunity to have yes. the broadest information available to everybody. So right, what website is it that you're talking about? Because I've it's been brought up a few times, but I, I don't actually know what. Uh, it's just in its infancy. Oh, cabin, it's not out to with the, the city. Yet? Is setting it up. It's okay. I believe it is open. No, yeah. it's open. B F R E. B C R E. No way. B F R E. B F R E. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, C A. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Boundary yeah. flood recovery. Yeah. B F R E. Dot C A. And I think there's a link on the city website. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. We have internet. Yeah. So there we go. That's what it looks like. That's really neat. <laughs> uh, I'm going to exit out of my So I actually haven't seen this yet, so I'll just sort of try to shrink it a bit. So um, that pop-up, it means people can sign up for notifications about things. That pop-up right. window, so go to the website and put your email down there. Do you want me to show the pop-up again? Yeah, for sure. Petri and I just did this. pop-up apparently hasn't been working for some people. Okay. Yeah, sorry. It didn't like my trick there, but yeah, it came up within probably about two seconds of me having opened the page. Yeah. So there we go. So 
there, so yeah, so we'll see if I can find, I'm probably under the environment, environmental updates. So we'll put some of that, try to put some of that information in there, but again, certainly ask the questions and, and ones that you think are going to be really useful for that greater good, we'll get some of that information out in there. So thank you. All right. I have a question. Okay. So we're talking about the high water level uh, mark where you could do work. Now let's say you have a parcel of property. In our case, we have six acres that all belongs to us, but we're down to two acres left. Right. Four of it, the river is taken away. So is that land that the river is taken away ours or the rivers? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so as a gen, yeah, you know, I can give you the general response. The general response is once the land is lost, it goes into the Online. provinces. That's it. Um, it. Some of it is based off the way your survey is, the way your land uh, land title shows, if it shows natural boundary, um, if it has four pins. We have pins way out in the river. So some yeah. of it is, honestly, some of it is your land boundary. So it's maybe it's something that you need to speak with in terms of the land's title. So but here's our situation. Would he have to pay for a surveyor to resurvey that so the government has the right idea of what this is and what's not? So that's where, this, this is a land's question. Um, it's not a water question. So it's something that will, Jim and I will. I will take that away uh, because it's a question that's come up yeah. previously. I think the question is that if you have pins out in the water, it's your land, but because it's water, we have jurisdiction to tell you to do things because it's now within the wetted perimeter. I think that's the answer. We talked about it in the truck at the previous meeting going to Rock Creek. So, so I think it's still your land, but because it's within a wetted perimeter, then our jurisdiction becomes valid because we protect water as the government but but i will take that question away and do my best to get an answer yeah and just looking looking really looking at that your land title if it says that natural boundary which yes. some of them do say then it's it's moving through um over to the process but yeah and maybe if you want to give jim your address that will probably help with do you want to, do you mind just writing down his address uh, who yeah. was, was that George? Yeah, I'll, I'll see you later. Okay. Okay. Because it's just it's really helpful. Um, questions sometimes at the hypothetical stage, um, you can sort of say big picture. Sometimes if you go right to okay, this is the property. Oh, okay, well, hang on. Let's let's start really looking at. It. So sometimes it's helpful at the big picture answer, and then this is what we've got. But yeah, a lot of the times you, you're really looking at that <coughs> land title to see if you've got natural boundary versus. Uh, Jim made a super good point, and even though it's private property, and so this goes for any any length, whether you lost it or not, um, even though it's uh, when it's private, even, sorry, even with private property, uh, you do still need to meet the Section 11, Section 10 permitting. Um, the private property does not exempt you from any of that. So the water, as Jim was saying, is still crowned, and you still have to. So a lot of this is coming in, like, um, Jenny's presentation, like looking at the big picture, bringing in the fisheries, and taking that the the, uh, the support, um, and just trying to look at the big picture of the river. And the river is is a crown um, provincial property. When you go into your application for for the approvals, both the approval and the notification. So there are two different types of permits that can happen under a Section 11. It's called approval and a notification. The notification, it's, it's uh, a number of clauses under the water sustainability regulation. And if you meet those low risk uh, activities that are stated in this regulation, then you can move it to a, a notification option. Just because it's a low risk activity, if it's not outlined in that regulation, it does not fall under the notification. So that's something that's I know really frustrating for a lot of people. They're saying this is so benign, but because it's not fitting in that, in the, the list of outline list of what can fit under the notification, um, it has to fit there to be that notification. 
A notification can move through, permit can move through a lot faster than an approval, which is why people are interested in it. They're also free. Um, so this is just a really quick uh, you know, couple of words explaining the notification. Uh, once we get into the regulation, it has a variety of different clauses that you have to meet. So under installation of a uh, road crossing culvert, and I'll show you the slide in just a second, I think there's 10 different conditions that you have to meet in order for it to be notification. Otherwise, it gets moved to an approval. So an approval is just requiring a more review. So we do do fisheries, uh, local governments, uh, potential uh, people that may be affected by the works, uh, our, our First Nations. So it really depends. It's like it, in terms of who we were referred to be Ministry of Transport, who we refer depends on what the potential project is and what are the potential implications for it. One of the things in the notification that I know that a lot of people are going to be looking at and saying, well, hang on, I'm repairing my bank erosion protection. This is only for works that was existing last year, functional existing last year. So one of the things that's really, so what you may find is most people that are following a flood, and I've been involved with a couple communities now that follow a flood event, um, nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, uh, the, a lot of the people want to improve the rank erosion protection because it failed. So they don't want to just replace what they had last year. What I, we have done, certainly for situations, is said, you know what, I had a tow, this is where the tow was, so do you understand the tow of a bank protection? So you got your slope. So this is this is land here. Here's my water. And so let's say we're putting, if it had to be rock, doesn't always, but if it did. Um, so you've got your slope coming down here, and then you have a toe at the base. What you're trying to do is prevent water from undermining your works. And and it's really important. I I watched somebody lose thirty thousand dollars worth of rock in a period of about an hour, and they ended up losing their house as well. Uh, it didn't get tied into a high point and the water just undermined and outflanked the work. So a lot of the, the information coming from those qualified professionals is really there to also help with the big picture. It's having somebody pull back and say, okay, what do we think of the big picture of it? Um, so the toe is that, that rock at the base of it. When somebody comes to me and says, all right, Christina, we got to get this done. And I've heard that a lot. We've got to get this done this year. Uh, what we may end up doing is saying, okay, we're going to try to split you. We're going to do part of it under notification, and we're going to do the major repair under um, the approval process. But what it could do is it can potentially get some of that base work done, but again, it's just repairing what you had previously. So if, um, if you had, um, I don't know, old car parts as your bank erosion protection and you're looking to put in rock, <laughs> we're not gonna be able to run that under notification. You laugh, but. <laughs> uh, so so it is, so that's something to also think of. Um, we're here to certainly work with you and talk with you to get through some of this. Uh, but yeah, so something to think about. Uh, what I, I want to brainstorm when somebody's really caught for time. Christina, I, got, I have a question. <laughs> yes. Um, for the repairing of a dike, do you need to go through the owners of that dike in order to do that work? Yeah, so we're not giving you permission to cross on anybody else's property. Right, so, it, I'm saying if it's on, if it's an already existing dike on your property, but it's owned by the city, for example, can you apply for a notification to do work on it? Or is that has to be done by the, the, the owner, the owner yes. of, the, of the dike? Definitely. Okay. So the biggest thing with the dike, and I'm really glad you brought that one up, because I didn't even go to dikes because that's such a big story. Um, dike, even though the dike repair gets done under notification, you also have to meet all the conditions out of the Dike Maintenance Act. And so that's not easy. Um, you're dealing with the same thing that we're talking about at the meeting, how they're having to remove some of the some of the works that have been that were quickly put in during the middle of the flooding. Uh, and they're having to remove it because they're not engineered properly. They're not they're not stabilized. So anybody going to do any work on a dike if, if somebody went and did work on a dike that was a local government or city dike they could end up voiding the dike and and it would have to be re-engineered and replaced so yeah the big one is don't definitely go to the owner of the dike or especially if it's a local government to let them do do the dike work um 
I didn't really go too much. So Jenny had a had a the, she had the uh, slide, the web page of this is the page you go to, to to start your application process. This is right after you click that page. Uh, so this is just a really quick screenshot. I'm not going to really go into the process of clicking the different buttons, uh, but this is start your application, change it about a stream, whether it's a notification or an approval, they're both done on the same application. Uh, we really spoke a lot about you know who puts it in, when do you put it in. It's really, again, a case-by-case -case basis. If you're trying to do a stream reach and there's some information that looks like we're gonna be able to get a number of neighbors together, the preferred option is to do as many together as you can. Uh, one is one application fee. Um, and, and it's a big picture uh, audit. That may require that qualified professional. Some of you may not require a qualified professional for a smaller amount of work. So there's different, a lot of different options. Um, Jenny brought in some really cool uh, comments about like it's just how it's the velocity of, this, of the water that often causes a damage rather than the actual water. I know that some people have made an effort to try to put in, um, protect their banks, whether it's through vegetation and trees, but also allowing it so that they will naturally still inundate with water, but then that the water will then come out and then they've got their, their land. Um, again, that's just, you know, it was a, a really great comment of the river is going to keep working at it. It's going to keep, the water is going to keep showing. Uh, I've been in government for less than 10 years. I've seen many one in 100 year events, quite a few one in 200 year events, a one in 500 year event, and now just one in, just under one in 1,000, if that's what they call the Granby. So there's a lot of changes going on. Um, we're also dealing with the droughts that we hadn't seen before. So there is a lot of changes. A lot of it's going to be how do we work and, and sort of make this function for the long term. Um, so whether that is inundating some of the areas of water or whether that is you know hardening an outside bend. Um, the more we just harden the banks, so if, I, if we turn around and just harden all the banks with the riprap, you're just increasing that velocity to move it through. Uh, yeah, you can end up having a lot of problems in the long run. These are just a couple of the things. Each one of these is a case-by-case -case basis, so not everybody has some of these issues on there. But we're going to be looking at that habitat of the fisheries. I'll talk to you a little bit about timing here. Long-term viability. I know the Kimberley, I don't know if you're aware of the, the Kimberley Canal, um, big concrete flume that we had going through Kimberley, they pulled it out. The viability of concrete is, you know, it's got a lifespan. So, you know, it's looking at, you know, what is that viability? What are the other hydrological influences? I spoke a bit about those fingers going into the river, the groins. How is that going to affect other areas? The, this, the comment on dredging, um, you, you're right, it won't fill, the whole channel will not fill up in one year. But the first areas that got dredged, they could easily fill up in one big event. And so all of a sudden, you've got these holes. And once you start changing the morphology, different areas are being eaten out. And then somebody else's property says, I never had any erosion here before. And all of a sudden now, my whole bank is going. So dredging is, it's got a lot going on there. It's not just a simple, let's just make the channel deeper. So. That's uh, not that it's not an option, it's just there is a lot of components to it. Just a, again, it's just information. Some of the things that I'm gonna be looking at, it, it varies between different types of, uh, of applications and different bits that people are looking at. Um, what are we doing in terms of where the, that water level is? How are we protecting it? So what's the equipment being used? Have we got contractors that are familiar with working in water? Are they going to have to have the equipment right in the water, or is, are we going to be working? Um, are you going to be able to stay on the bank and pound the water? And are you using a thumb on the excavator? Um, are we having to use a spider hoe, and you've actually changed all the fluids in the machine so that you are now moving right in the water with the spider hoe? So, not everyone's going to need it, right? Not everyone's going to need the spider hoe with a revamp of all the fluid. Um, so it's it's. If there's not a, a cookie cutter bit of information, this is all the information we need, but just some of the things that we're looking at, how is the riparian being affected? Um, what are we gonna potentially be doing for the downstream mitigation stuff? When? So this is one of the handouts on the table. Um, these are your, your basic 
um, least risk windows for doing in-stream works. One of the big things you have to remember is that if you're not in the water, so you're not actually below that wetted perimeter, you don't have to abide by these timelines. So this is only for when you're actually working in the water. These are set up to help protect the fisheries. There's no water, there's no fish. So there's no eggs. Um, the other one that people say is, well, what about frozen? Can I work in the frozen condition? If it's frozen right to the stream bed, you, again, you're, there's no fish swimming in the ice. So, so you can work. So a lot of people say, I like working in the frozen because I, I don't have any effect on any of my land as I move all my machinery over on it. Harder to pound in rocks on the bank. So, you know, it's sort of understanding what's the best timing for your property and quite frankly, for also getting the contractors because really everybody's pretty busy right now. So understanding too, what is the timing for some of that? Um, so the other one too, sometimes people are gonna look at me and say, but it's gonna be way better for me to work at the lowest water possible. If I work at really low water, then I, I have very little in-stream work to do. What do you think about that? And so then what I'm gonna do is go back to the habitat biologist and say, okay, I've got this spot on the kettle. This is the location. What do we think? What, what have we got for flexibility on it? And then they're gonna come back to me with that. So they're gonna be looking probably in terms of a QP information. All right, have we got spawning in there? Is there spawning gravels in that location? So if so, then maybe we've got a bunch of eggs in there. So if we start pounding in all the rock, then we've got a problem with that. Uh, so they're going to be looking at what are the habitats. So we got what's the habitat component? It could be species at risk in that area. And then they're going to be coming back to me. You know what? Your section is good. If you're using putting rock in for the toe of your slope, then then you can use it with a thumb. So yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, it's in cases if the house is in, not in danger. But what if the house is in danger? Oh, sorry. For example, if, we, if we're waiting for window and you come up to one people, another, another, and yeah. you're saying, no, this is not good window to work on that first. Yeah. But the house is not wait, waiting for window. Totally. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. And so then the more information you give me, so then I'm going to turn around and go back to the habitat officer and say, okay, this is, we need to ha understand the situation of OMPS. We've got a house that's being undermined. We've got to get in. What do we do? So then we're going to be dealing with a qualified professional to say, you know, well, what about this? This is an area that you're going to, you're going to be able to move your machinery in this spot. Like each, each is a case by case situation. I can speak at the hypothetical level, but it, it really is. So if somebody turns around and says, I've got an undermined house that I need to get rock in right now. Um, yeah, it's, it's a case by case. Our, our, we're not going to be letting a house go in. So yeah, it's basically it's my question like, because the house is not asking for permit, it's your goal. Yeah. Like, do we have option to increase the window to work on that? Yeah, so what I'm saying is that this is the preferred. So if you send me the application with these dates on it, I'm like, oh, well, met the window dates. Yeah. Uh, check mark, on to the next question. And, and so somebody else comes in, one of the boxes in there says, are you meeting the window dates? <laughs> and uh, we get a lot of no's. Um, no, I'm not meeting it, and this is, I've got a qualified professional that told me this, this, and this, or I'm not meeting it because I think I'm going to be able to do it in full frozen ground, or I think it's going to be totally dry by November. So I've decided to cross my fingers and wait it out, or it's like there's a lot of options, or I've isolated the whole area. Now, they're not going to be excited if you've isolated out a huge spawning area. Um, but so it's, it's understanding, okay, what have we got? What, have, what are we playing with? Uh, what are we doing in terms of the batch applications? How are we gonna be working with through this? Again, if this is gonna be multi-year, they can be multi-year permits. Um, it's really at the discretion. Uh, so we spoke a little bit about that, that regulation and I told you there's a terrible slide coming up. Don't worry, you're not expected to read any of this. Uh, but it just says with that notification component that this is that road crossing culvert one, there's a lot of conditions. So it, you, you check off notification, somebody come from front counter and says, it's not a notification, sorry. This is why. It's because they have to meet a whole bunch of other components within that regulation. This is the worst looking one of the bunch. Can I, can I ask, who, you're talking about uh, building these dikes and all that. Okay, and you're telling us almost that we could build these dikes. We could build them? 
Is that what you're talking about? Because you're talking about where the machinery is and whatever. So are these tires going to be built by us? So That's what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. So the term dike, so this is the, the, the whole definition component. For, for us, to, to, for a dike under a dike maintenance act, you, you're covering multiple properties and it would usually be a local government or a society. I don't know too much about the society taking on the building. Bank of Origin Protection, protecting <coughs> the property, it is, uh, that I know of, it is the, the landowner that applies for the permit and the landowner that's doing the work, yes. So then each individual, one of us, apply for a per permit and build a dike across our property, then the next neighbor does and the next neighbor. Is that what it's going to be? I don't understand the, who's building these dikes. You guys are, we are, who is? So I don't get it. If you want, would you like me to try that? Sure. Stuff. I guess. Let's, is that is that what it is? Yep. Okay, he's answering. Let me let me try and answer that. I think what we're talking about here, in the predominant number of cases, are individual works that an individual can do on their property. Um, if we're talking about dikes. There's, there's different legislation, so I don't think we're talking about dikes here so much. Um, if, if, although, if there were three adjacent properties that talk and work together and get approval to do a similar and connected bank, bank, erosion. bank erosion, then, then, they could individually get permits, or they could get one permit, put it in one person's name, and everybody agrees to it. So, so we're talking about individual site bank erosion. We're not talking about long continuous dikes that that are multi-million dollars that that there has to be an owner of. So, we're talking about individual people or small groups of people working on. Uh, Erosion, uh, uh, a little bit of work to put to put trees in that sort of activities. It's it's individual, small scale, very likely, but not always small scale kind of erosion. That's we're not talking about big dikes. That's the city and regional district we're talking about. That. Okay. Well, what happened in our area at Johnson Flats is when we built the dike, all we were thinking about is how to save our home. Yeah. We didn't know about all these rules. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I did make a note that I think we ought to know where the legal, official, owned dikes are because there could be a lot of quote unquote dikes that are not dikes by definition of the legislation that are just small works that people have done over the years in order to protect their properties or collect their properties. So, so if okay if i get a hold of one of you people and you come to our place and you tell us is the dike okay can we leave it or it's illegal and you're going to tear it down so uh, how does that work i think that's part of the bigger process that the bigger recovery team will will speak to that if there's broader diking uh reinforcement or meeting new standards then i think that's the bigger committee I don't think we're talking about that tonight. That's so there's no, there's no government dikes. Is that what you're saying? I think there are some, but not. Some of the dikes are government dikes, but some of them are not. Some of them are just features that have been built or created over in days by. David, you want to take over? Well, just, just about the government piece. The <clears throat> The city has two registered dikes in Grand Forks. And one is on the Granby River. Um, so from the, the Central Avenue Bridge north. And then one is in uh, North Rockle. So South Rockle and Johnson Flats don't have registered dikes. So those are berms that were put up by... Um, by individuals like us. Right. So, so they're not registered. So they're not under the dike maintenance uh, 
Act. Act. And so they could so be torn down. <coughs> and, and yet we just well, talked about individually building dikes. Right. They're all private property. So yeah, we, so it's it's a <coughs> Let me let me speak to it a little bit because I started asking that question right after we had our fund. And I said, you know, we're not in the city, we're in the regional district because we're Darcy Road, so we're outside of the city limits and there's individual properties all along there. I said, you know, is there gonna be some assistance to put in some burns or diking in our area so that we're ready for the next high water? And they said, <coughs> chances are uh, you will probably have to do all the works yourself. Uh, but what they're going to focus on are the areas where there's maybe 50 homes. And they're saying, okay, maybe if there's going to be funding, we're going to try to protect 50 homes. But you that's up, uh, you know, uh, up to Granby or something like that, the individual home, you're going to have to take care of that yourself. And that's what I think this seminar is to help the individual landowners that are outside of the big picture, whether it's the Russell or the Johnson Flats or other areas, we're going to have to do our own thing. So so are, we not, are we only speaking about this work done within that riparian zone? We are speaking about work done. I can in the middle of a field. We're speaking work done from a top bank down. Mm -hmm. The question yes. has come up There's was what what if you're doing with works within that queue, so that one in one hundred year flood zone or one in two hundred year flood zone? Um, I have to get back to to you, and we're gonna put that information on that website on it. From how I've usually worked is top of bank down. Yeah. Those so when we're if I want to build an earthworks or a, you might call it a dike or whatever, and I'm two hundred feet back. From you know, from the bank, and it's not the repairing zone. I can build whatever in heck I like. I'm going to want, if I want to use the Dutch example and build a poldar and put my house in an island in the middle of that, that doesn't that doesn't really under the act classify isn't classified as a dike, even though it is. Uh, is that correct? So a dike. So yes. Yeah, so two couple points. Uh, I have to figure out this the one in one hundred. The comment that it got, was made in the sense of, are we having to expand the, the permitting? Um, that I just heard today, so I need to get back and put that note up on the website. And so for any, yeah, for any earthen berms, a dike can only be managed by a local government, regional districts, and then <coughs> David, right? Yeah. David mentioned uh, that he heard about community group societies being able to do it. A dike is a, a built berm structure along the, uh, at the river edge uh, across a bright a number of different properties so it's a fairly difficult <coughs> to be able to get it for exactly some of the concerns that our people are having is that you know once it fails and also it can trap water they need to be done properly yes so i think the question is um if it's on private property and it's a burb um can, it can, they, can and it was damaged and they did whatever they had to do to protect their homes as if they could um, keep it there or as long as it's not considered a dike right. so that's that's the definition of, the dike? of the dike so the dike is uh, a firm and i don't know if there's a height restriction on it that's that's protecting a number of properties but how it's built doesn't matter in terms of the dike, yes because once it's once it's defined and defined as a dike under the dike maintenance act it does have very specific regulations to how it can be built for example if i'm going to do something on our property it's not a dike it's a burb right. <laughs> well, and if you're tying it into all of your neighbors and you all no, have the only, same only if it's on your property it's not a dike if it's it's not a dike under our definition and then it doesn't get covered under that dike maintenance act so I think in Johnson Flats, there is no official dike right now. Is that correct? There's not a registered dike. There is no dike. No. There's other no dikes, registered. but no registered dike. Okay. So they're and not he, bound by the reg dike regulations. There's some verb. I haven't looked into the Johnson Flat dike. The government website defines a dike as, uh, it's defined in the Dike Maintenance Act as 
an embankment, wall, fill, piling, pump, gate, flood box, pipe, sluice, culvert, canal, ditch, drain, or any other thing that is constructed, assembled, or installed to prevent the flooding of land. In British Columbia, dikes are works that address major flood hazards. That's what you they give You should, you. and I will get you the clause in there because I had to do this for another property where we had two people that were protecting uh, an area, and I commented on that definition. And it has to protect more than one property. So that's a big, that's a big one. It's you're just protecting one property. It's not considered a dike under the Dike Maintenance Act. So let's get the type of a verb or deviation permit for a verb. If you're, if you, if I put a verb around my property and I don't live on the river, do I need a permit? So this is where that comment of the Q, the one in 100 year and one in 200 year event. But no, usually if you're above that top of bank and you're quite a, well, I always use a bit of leeway moving it back. If you're above that top of bank, you are outside of the Water Sustainability Act jurisdiction. I gotta figure out this one in 100, one in 200 year event uh, question that came up at the beginning of today. Yes. Hey, one, one question. So I live on, I live in Johnson Flats on the river, okay? Yeah. So for lack of a better term, I got a buffer zone from my property line yep. to the river water. Okay. Who owns that property? Me. Then, then look after. <laughs> uh, you have a you have a property line, a buffer line. I don't understand this. You well, have there's a strip of a strip of land between the river and my property. You probably can go onto land's title and find out. Well, well, the city of Grand Forks originally used to own it because it was supposed to be for a road. Okay. Okay. So if it's city property, why won't the city do something about it? Oh, I can't speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but, okay, no, well, but but I, I can tell you so, how to find that information in terms of who might own it because that, but, that's the landscape. But here again, okay, so if I want to protect my property, can I only go from my property line back, like to my house? We, you you, you, you have, have to. So as a Water Sustainability Act permit, we do not give you permission to go on somebody else's property. Whether that's crown land or provincial or so, your neighbor. Okay, so if um, Johnson Flats, yeah. the stuff that's within the city, because yeah. part of Johnson Flats is also in the regional district, okay? Yeah. Most of it has that buffer, buffer line, okay, yeah. between your property line and river. So we really can't go in and do any erosion protection regardless. I think what you do then is you speak to the owner of that property and figure out, yeah what's happening okay and i think maybe that some of that information might be coming through the big picture of what's going okay. on that's the city of grand forks there you well, go. maybe we don't know for sure pretty sure okay well i, I don't know no but so but yeah does anybody but uh, we we would not through this permit we do not give you permission to go on somebody else's property so when i'm issuing a permit for yeah. uh for bangor's protection smaller works which is where this permit is and thank you jim for that um we're issuing it to that landowner. So, so if, if you're trying to do work on your neighbor's property, we're going to be issuing the permit to your neighbor. Yeah. And it's going to be all under your neighbor. Um, so, yeah, so great to see everybody helping out, but knowing that it's the landowner that's going to get the. Thank you. And then you're. You, so, if the landowner does. If you do repairs on your property and you affect somebody downstream. Are you responsible for that? You liable to be sued? Did they can prove it? Yes or no? Just say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good um, I would say it's, it's a council. It, 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 uh, it's what they call criminal law. Uh, oh. The answer that I, I had that question lots of times in lots of circumstances. Civil and, and what would a reasonable what ought a reasonable person to have done and the courts will make the judgment on the facts of the individual circumstance so if you if you abuse uh, normalcy and abuse uh, um, rational thought then you're you're potentially liable but the courts will decide in, in each and every this case and, uh, that's my best answer through wasn't there just a case, uh, I, I, maybe I'm way off base on this, but of a Cray Creek that somebody put in some sandbags and it ended up diverting the creek and washed out the whole beach right up to the house on, uh, on, the, uh, on the one side there. Uh, and it took away the beach and, uh, 
and the property right up to the house, I understand. And so there's going to be some question about who's responsible for uh, for that action. Yeah, it was a private homeowner that 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 put in uh, a tiger dam, like the one that was down this yep. down the street, just on the edge of his property. But it it wasn't really put in the way that tiger dams are supposed to put in. You might have seen this one and the, the bolts are still in the road from where they bolted it down. And it was, it was put on just kind of soft ground and sand and rock. So the hydrologist that was there on Wednesday said it probably didn't do much, um, but there was water up against it and it had nowhere to go. So it was over on, over on the across the creek neighbor's property. I don't know if there's any lawsuits or anything that are, that's gonna that's gonna come out of it. Both both properties were were pretty pretty badly flooded, um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a consideration thing, right? Like you need to you need to kind of look after your neighbors. And like Jim was saying, if it's if you're taking beyond a, a reasonable or rational approach, then then yeah, you could be you could be liable for the, for the damages. But this is what the permitting process is for. If you get a permit and you get a qualified professional looking at and, and designing how this is going to sit in, they think about the downstream impacts and and the likeliness of if there is a likelihood of it to cause problems for people down the river. That's that's part of the analysis that happens in, with the qualified professional. Can we get a permit for about twenty years then? Because we don't know when the flood will happen. You get a permit for 20 years? No, because a permit is to get the works done, and then the permit expires. So you're going to be the, the goal is to get whether it's bank motion protection or vegetation and bioengineering. It's to get the works done, and then then the permit is expired. So you're not going to be going. You're not going to be given 20 years to get the works done. Years to How long? Yeah. You know what? If you came to me and said I need three years. Um, I've, I've issued permits for Thanks. five years. It, it depends on what the job is, what the person says. I've also had people that had one for two years that came back and said, I need an extension of time. I need two more years. So it's, again, case by case um, and, and the severity of the situation. Another quick question. This section 11 where all this stream is stuff, okay? Is this relatively new? Is this because of the BC Water State Bills? No, it was called Section 9 before. We've was... always been able to go play in the river with a permit? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. No, but you can. Yeah, under Section really? 9. Yeah. Okay. Under Section 9, you, you've always you've always had to get a permit yeah. to work in the river. Um, was there anybody that was doing it illegally? I Maybe once. Yeah. <laughs> really great. Um, but right now, like it's been fantastic. So that you don't have foreshore license licenses anymore, like like riparian rights. Well, a lot of industries in that used to be like in Nelson, you know, on the West Arm when there was industry along there. They pretty much did whatever they, were, even though there was some oversight yeah. in other areas. I mean, they were allowed foreshore rights for industrial purposes, and they didn't bring anybody in. Uh, you know, if, when work was done, the new pilings had to be driven or anything like that. They, so they kind of had a continuing right to do that within a defined area yeah. and within a defined set of activities. Yeah. I mean, I worked for BC Ferries for a long, long time. Yeah. And at all our terminals, if we've got to do grip wrap or drive piles or change anything, nobody asks any permission. I mean, we're grandfathered in. And there may be some oversight to see that we're not going beyond those defined areas. Well, I'd actually say that's not true. Huh? <laughs> that's, that's not true. I, I am permitted. <laughs> I, I'm permitted Heroprocter Ferry work. Oh, no, I'm talking about BC Ferry. Schwartz Bay, Sawasan. Cooney Lake? Oh, not Cooney Lake. That's how it is. That's a whole other okay. thing. Uh, oh. Uh, oh, oh, the big Vancouver people? Okay. Yeah, what's well, Oh, really? This is full they, safe protection yeah. work. Come on. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying that even up here. Yes, BC at BC Hydros. One of those notification options was. Uh, minor maintenance by a public utility. They still have to go through the process um, and they still have to provide that information. But yeah, so some, some of that. Under an emergency flood, under a flood protection, there's a lot of work that was happening really, really fast. They are not going through each one of these every time they're trying to do something. Um, so they're, they're falling under the uh, emergency flood protection. We've got to save infrastructure, house. We've got a variety of different things that has to happen. 
As soon as the area has been declared a flood zone, a uh, disaster, what's the term? Disaster. Disaster flood. They're, they're, so it's, it's the, the local government will put in an state emer of emergency. State of emergency. Thank you. So once a state of emergency has been declared, it can be declared an area can be declared by the minister, or it can be declared uh, by the province or the local government. Then, then that starts enacting a whole bunch of get the job done, um, and that's why then there's works have to be removed afterwards because they were just done to get the job, and we just had to get that one site protected. Now we need to do something proper. Um, this is this is okay. Now I've got to turn around and and pr protect my property so that when the next high water event, that high velocity comes through, I've got that, that security. I keep talking, so I'm aware of the time. Um, I don't mind continuing to talk, but I think that we'll probably call it for right now. Uh, there are a couple of pages here, uh, information for timing windows, um, websites. Thank you very much.